Welcome to today's talk on standing waves on strings. What are we learning? We will review both constructive and destructive interference. We're going to take a look at standing waves and the harmonic series. Our essential questions, how is a standing wave formed? And what is the relationship between the frequencies of the first, second, and subsequent standing waves in the harmonic series? If two waves having the same frequency and amplitude, like this blue one and this green one, are in phase, the resultant wave, when they combine, has the same frequency as the individual waves, but twice their amplitude like this. These waves are said to be in phase and to exhibit constructive interference. Now the blue wave and the green wave have the same frequency and amplitude but are 180 degrees out of phase. In this case the crest of one coincides with the trough of the other so one wave is inverted relative to the other. The resultant wave when they combine has zero amplitude. These two waves are said to be out of phase and to exhibit destructive interference. We are going to use the concept of constructive and destructive interference to show how standing waves are formed. Here are standing waves in a slinky. If the slinky is vibrated at exactly the right frequency, the wave appears to stand still, which is why they're called standing waves. Standing waves are an interference pattern created by periodic pulses sent down the medium and the reflected waves. Let's take a look at how these are made. Let's say we have somebody sending periodic pulses down a rope. So if she oscillates the end of the rope at just the right frequency, a standing wave will form. A node occurs where the two waves always have the same magnitude of displacement but opposite sign, so the net displacement is zero at that point. There's no motion in the string at these nodes. But midway between are two adjacent antinodes, a place where the string vibrates with the largest amplitude. So let's take this apart. The incident wave is the solid line. The reflected wave is the dotted line. At this point, they are perfectly in phase. A moment later, notice that the reflected wave and the incident wave are perfectly out of phase. Here we have destructive interference and we have zero amplitude. A moment later, the incident wave has moved to the right, the reflected wave to the left, and again we have our node here and the two places where we have the maximum displacement or amplitude. The overall effect is what we call a standing wave. Here's another look at this. We can call the wave up top the incident wave moving to the right, the reflected wave moving to the left. If we look at certain spots here, say where the nodes are, here where the dot is, here's another node, here's another node. These two waves always are perfectly out of phase. Now, the places where we have the maximum displacement are the anti-nodes here. Sometimes they are out of phase and sometimes they are in phase. So when they flatten out, they are out of phase now and now. At the anti-nodes where the maximum displacement happens, sometimes they are in phase and sometimes they are out of phase. When it flattens out, they are out of phase, like right now and now. They are perfectly in phase when they're at their maximum displacement or the largest amplitude. That would be now. And now. Now at certain frequencies for certain lengths of say a string and a certain string itself depending on its density we will get different modes of standing waves and only at certain frequencies do these occur. 
Notice that we have nodes at each end. And in this one, we have a node in the middle. We have two on this third one. And on the fourth one, we have one, two, three in between the nodes at the end. We have on our first one, we have one large anti-node. The second one, we have two anti-nodes. The next one, we have one, two, three. And the last one, we have one, two, three, four. Let's start by looking at what we'll call the fundamental vibration of a standing wave on a string. Here's what it will look like on a slinky. And this will only form at certain uh, frequencies or certain vibrations. Now we want to start to relate the length of our string and the wavelength. If we plug this back into our wave speed equation, solve for frequency, we see that the frequency is the wave speed divided by twice the length. Now let's look at the second harmonic, or first overtone. Now we have an anti-node, two anti-nodes, and one node in the middle. Here's what it looks like on the slinky. For our second harmonic, notice how the length of the string is one wavelength. And we're using a subscript two to show that it's the wavelength of our second harmonic. Here we've plugged it into the wave speed equation and we get V over L. Now we're going to do a little trick here. I'm going to divide this part by two to make it look like the frequency of our first harmonic. And from that, we'll see that the second harmonic, the frequency that creates that, is twice the frequency of our first harmonic. Let's take a look at our third harmonic. Now we have one, two nodes and one, two, three anti-nodes. Here's what it looks like in our slinky. Look what we have for our third harmonic. Inside that length, or L, we have one wavelength here and we have a half. So we have one, two, three halves wavelength. So the length is three halves the wavelength. The frequency, as we plug it into our wave speed equation, is three times, remember this is here, our frequency of our first uh, overtone. So now we have a general equation for the frequency of each one of these harmonic uh, series. The third harmonic now is three times F. Let's review what we know about the length and how it relates to the wavelength of these different standing waves. For our first harmonic, the length is equal to one half a wavelength. For our second, it is the length is equal to one wavelength. Our third, the length is equal to three halves a wavelength. And finally, for our fourth, the, wave, the length is equal to two times the wavelength. Now let's take a look at the frequency for our different harmonics. If we have our fundamental frequency here of a wave, a standing wave on a string, and we call that F1, that frequency, the second harmonic will have twice that frequency. The third harmonic will have three times the fundamental frequency. And our fourth harmonic will have four times our fundamental frequency. The relationship given here that F sub n, that n being an integer, one, two, three, or four, is n times our first frequency. All right, thanks for listening. Complete your Cornell notes, rewind, and review as necessary.